Welcome to a new monthly segment we're calling Tales from Divorce Court. Sounds scary, doesn't it? Sometimes it is. Stuff I've seen and experienced in 20 plus years working in the divorce courts of Chicagoland, okay? How does that sound? Get the lowdown, real world, on how to approach key issues in your case and also learn what not to do, okay? This month, Tales from Divorce Court with the subtitle, The Old Grab and Run, okay? One of the scariest things I deal with, and what are we talking about here? We're talking about a parent grabbing one of their kids and taking off for Wisconsin, California, Mexico or Mother Russia. I've seen them all and I'm going to talk about three stories with key points uh, to learn to uh, take away from each little story. Okay, ready? Number one, um, let's talk about what the law is just so we kind of have a working knowledge, then we jump into the story, okay? So before there's any court activity, you can do whatever you want, right? Um, you're married with kids, right? There's no conflict yet, um, you know, meaning legal, married or unmarried, same, same deal. Uh, you can do whatever you want, right? You're a parent, mother, father, doesn't matter, right? If there's not a court order that says this is your parenting time and this is the other parent's parenting time or, you know, somebody has sole decision-making responsibility, sole custody, joint custody, just all of that stuff. If we're before there's any legal structure around this relationship other than, you know, somebody's a mom, somebody's a dad, mother, um, wife, or husband, you can do whatever you want. It's a, uh, it's a free for all, so to speak. It's one of the best reasons actually why you want to get a case in court, because if you have concerns, you don't want it to be a free for all. So that's kind of the law and the thought process in terms of before there's something in the court system. Now, what's the law though? Like once there is a case on file, going through to sort of like once a final judgment has been entered with regards to custody in parenting time. And it's, it's pretty simple in, in the Chicago area and the six collar counties. Um, we don't really practice in all six, but right. Cook, Lake McHenry, DuPage, Will, probably Kane. I, I, I never I haven't taken a case in Kane in 10 years, but basically greater Chicago land, the rule is you can't relocate the residence of a minor child more than 25 miles away from their current permanent residence. If you're the majority time parent, or if it's a 50-50 parenting setup, you're not al allowed to relocate more than 25 miles, basically unless a court lets you. So, right, if you're doing a grab and run in that situation, right, after there's court activity, legal structure around it, you're taking actions that aren't consistent with what the law is in Illinois, okay? So that's the big picture, the 25 mile rule, when it applies, when it doesn't apply. So now, three tales from divorce court, ready? First, I'm gonna talk about a guy who was in the, um, who was a victim of, this guy was a client of ours. He was a victim of a grab and run in the pre-court situation, nothing was in court yet. And here's the thumbnail, because it's a scary story, like legit scary. This guy, um, boy, and this case happened a minute ago. But in doing this for 20 years, this was probably about year 11 or something. Here's the uh, quick summary, if this can be helpful to you. Um, like I said, this is pre-court, so there's no structure, you know, there's no legal uh, custodial parent, there's no legal parenting time around the situation.
But dad, I'm going to just call him um, Marcus, not his real name, was the clear majority time parent. Kids lived with him. Kids went to school in a school district by him. Sometime, I want to say it was the last day of winter break or something, he was going to, you know, he and the mom were kind of handling things, let's, let's just say, outside the system. And um, so he was going to just, actually, no, he wasn't going to let her do this. She did this, though. This was her doing the old grab and run. She basically picked up the kids early or something on the Friday or Thursday, right at the start of the school's winter break, and took off to Mississippi with them. And was basically hiding out, if I recall correctly, at, at one of the in-laws. I think maybe that was where she was from originally, and maybe some parent extended family people were down there and zero communication with our, our guy, Marcus, the father, our client. And um, thankfully he was knowledgeable enough. He knew her well enough, kind of knew the, the backstory and the extended family that he at least knew where she was. Cause that was critical um, because he knew where she was, he was able to take action and, um, you know, he he took fast action and was able to get those kids back in a in a I want to say a week or less. What did we do in that situation? Here's the key point, I would say, if if you're a victim of a grab and run before there's any like underlying court orders. What we did for him was an order of protection, you know, orders of protection are common for using in domestic violence situations, but one of the reasons uh, why you should use an order of protection is there's language in there with regard to the concealment of minor children. That's what I use orders of protection for almost as much as the domestic violence um, situation, just because I don't think orders of protection are that effective for domestic violence stoppage. But when you have a grab and run, you need to get in court ASAP. And the order of protection has a little more strength and a little more like criminal component for violations of it than just your old standard civil court order. So that's what we do in that situation. This guy was able to run down to Mississippi again because he knew where the kids were and basically got the help of law enforcement down in some county in Mississippi. He was able to get possession of the kids. So that's my first scary tale from divorce court about a grab and run situation. And what's the key point there? You got to act fast. Um, order of protection is the best way to do it. And I think thirdly, that that just this just this sort of goes maybe maybe implicitly, but one of the reasons he was in this situation was because he had not previously kind of set up a court process where, you know, there could have been something on file with the school or something that said, you know, he's the, the sole custodial parent, mom doesn't have access, or mom's parenting time is you know, alternate weekends or something, because he didn't do that in advance, we had to deal with this kind of emergency situation. So we got a great result for that guy. He got the kids back and they're safe and stuff. But that's kind of the key takeaway. If you're in a situation before there's any other court orders in play, the, um, the order of protection is the move for concealment of minor children, okay? Now, these next two situations are going to be in the, let's call it the after- previous court activity. So now we're under a situation where clearly the 25 mile rule is in effect. And if somebody's violating, you know, moving with a child or children outside that 25 mile window, there are potential ramifications. And I wanna to talk to you about a, about a couple stories because they went in very, um, very different ways, okay? So here's a little tale about mom who wanted to, head to Las Vegas and be a nurse or something, if, if I recall correctly. We, um, we'd we represented this guy before, the father in this situation. And so there was a generic kind of custody situation for Bill. Again, not his real name. And my recollection is the mom was the majority time parent, but dad had significant parenting time. 
And so, right, there's a structure, you know, mom's sole custodial parent, but dad, you know, maybe has two or three um, days of parenting time each week. He's a good guy, very active, involved with these kids. I'm going to say they were kind of 12, 13, you know, age. And so I represented him, let's just say 10, yeah, maybe six years ago. Hadn't heard from him. What I'm going to talk about in this grab and run was now he's reaching back out to us maybe three or four years later. You know, everything had been set up just kind of a normal case three or four years ago. And it, what's happening is he has these kids, again, who are old enough to kind of see what's going on, understand what's going on. Um, again, I'm, I'm, my recollection is we're talking like middle school aged two, um, two kids. And through the kids, our client Bill is learning about the fact that mom has now sort of slowly gotten herself settled in Nevada, Las Vegas, Las Vegas, Nevada, with with new work again i think she was at a, a, a doing a nursing job at a hospital i think some of her extended family people were out there so again she kind of tipped her hand you know our client bill knew about her family out there but then what was really getting him concerned was that you know she's taking a job out there, you know, in a, in a, in, in a workspace where you're not doing it remote or something. And this is, you know, this is long before, you know, COVID kind of blew up how everybody works and it's a nursing job. So I think she's at a hospital or something. So I don't think she's doing it on the computer. And um, now mom is basically starting to have the kids involved and I don't know, attempting to just communicate with them about, Hey, you want to live out here and getting them in school and getting some things set up for them in Las Vegas. And so basically Bill, the father, our client gets wind of this. And, you know, we go in on some emergency motion. We didn't have to do an order of protection at this point, because number one, there's already clearly stuff in court where she can't be going more than 25 and basically, our client, Bill, has now learned of the mom's plan, right? Mom's plan to do the grab and run. She hadn't done it yet, though. So now we're able to lock everything down with court orders before she does the grab and run. <clears throat> Excuse me. However, mom has already kind of set herself up, up out in Las Vegas and stuff. So now she's really put herself in a jam and, you know, basically she put herself in the situation where now she loses custody of the kids because, right, she, you know, she wanted to do something proper. She needed to ask a court to give her approval and move more than 25 miles. She was going to do a grab and run. It was obvious to the court. And so now, boom. Dad automatically, not automatically, I mean, we had to have a court to get it done, but dad becomes the majority time parent. Mom's parenting time is extremely limited now because A, right, she's living, whatever, 1,500 miles away. And two, you really worry about the safety of the kids with mom, right? Is she going to try another grab and run you know, she's really undermined herself in terms of trust and credibility to the court. OK, so what's kind of the key point in this situation? Mom kind of thinking about and going, let's just say, 50 percent of the way to doing the grab and run. It's it's really it's a high risk situation and you really need to be be wise about it right i wasn't her attorney but right um i mean this case had been in court before i'd been this guy's lawyer before if i recall correctly mom had a lawyer in the kind of the first iteration of the case and so you gotta think okay bill the father isn't going to be that clueless to not know what's going on and is the risk really worth it because right she lost custody of the kids and really curtailed her uh, parenting time 
when she tried to do a grab and run, planned to do a grab and run, and then was stopped. So that's um, tale from divorce court number two. Let me talk about tale of, of divorce court number three. And again, there is a, there's court orders in place for our client, uh, Samantha. Again, not real name. There's court orders. Mom, Samantha, our client is majority time parent. Dad, again, I would say has average parenting setup, maybe alternate weekends, little, little vacation time. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I'd been in court with, with this woman actually trying to do a, a legal relocation for her where, right, we're basically asking a court for various reasons, um, you know, new significant other, uh, new job and employment, some negative things that were happening to mom in Chicago, we were legally asking for her to be able to relocate to another state. Um, I think it was um, maybe Tennessee or something. And so we'd gone through that process for three to, three to six months. There was also some child support stuff going on during that time too. And here's the key point. Um, we didn't have a full hearing on it, but we'd gone down that road far enough, there was an attorney for the children involved. She'd given some recommendations to the judge. The judge had made some recommendations too, basically against, against us, against Samantha's case, against the idea that she should be able to relocate with her son or daughter to Tennessee. Okay. So that's where we were. We kind of let this, we, we just kind of, you know, Eventually, our, our client was like, hey, you know, basically the judge was kind of weighing in at a settlement conference. So it's like, eh, is it really worth going through a full hearing if it sounds like the judge is against us? And so kind of we paused the case. Now, I kept in touch with Samantha, you know, just kind of like we do with most of most of our clients. They, you know, I always think of it as kind of like your, you know, client. It's a client for life, you know, even though, you know, your case hopefully isn't taken forever. I always just kind of want to kind of touch base and, you know, kind of talk through stuff. And so here's the deal. Maybe six months after the case is out of the court system, Samantha actually does a grab and run. She takes her son, goes down to Tennessee or wherever. Again, I can't really gives you all the details on confidential situations. I'm kind of just talking some general principles. And, um, you know, she didn't get leave of court. You know, it's not like some criminal thing, right? It's not, but the law in Illinois is the 25-mile circle. However, you know, this is probably a year, year and a half ago now. I checked in with her in the last month or so just to say, hi, how you doing, Samantha? And here's what her feedback to me has been you know she hasn't i'll sometimes look at the court uh court docket on her case just to kind of see you know is the ex-husband doing anything to you know sort of enforce the law right the 25 mile rule pull the kids back because what she's doing again it's not some criminal violation but it isn't consistent with illinois law and because she never got uh leave of court but here's the thing. Dad has never done a thing. Dad is. And that's that's an important point in the old grab and run situation. Um, and I'll talk kind of both sides of it. Right. The party wanting to stop the grab and run has to take action. And here she needs to kind of have the wherewithal, the knowledge, you know, they have to care about it, maybe financial resources if they're going to grab a lawyer. And um, in this situation, I think my statement is Samantha really had some strong reasons and rationales to want to relocate out of the Chicago area. The ex-husband father, um, you know, he was an involved parent to some extent, but he was very passive 
in a very simple level, I don't think he was very well resourced in terms of financial abilities or his sophistication. So she actually got away with it. And so sometimes, for better or for worse, the grab and run just might work if you are confident that that other parent basically. I'm going to put it this way, isn't going to have the wherewithal, sophistication, resources, or give a damn enough to do something to stop you, okay? So that's a wrap. Those are three tales from Divorce Court. And the scariest thing I deal with, the old grab and run. So yeah, don't forget to subscribe and review our podcast, Lunch and a Divorce Lawyer. You can always find out more about me and my law firm at the pro, T-H-E-P-R-O dot lawyer. Thanks for joining us.